The Magic Egg by Frank Stockton, 1907. A short story, narrated by Red Media Production. The pretty little theater attached to the building of the Unicorn Club had been hired for a certain January afternoon by Mr. Herbert Loring, who wished to give therein a somewhat novel performance, to which he had invited a small audience consisting entirely of friends and acquaintances. Loring was a handsome fellow about thirty years old, who had traveled far and studied much. He had recently made a long sojourn in the Far East, and his friends had been invited to the theater to see some of the wonderful things he had brought from that country of wonders. As Loring was a clubman, and belonged to a family of good social standing, his circle of acquaintances was large, and in this circle a good many unpleasant remarks had been made regarding the proposed entertainment made, of course, by the people who had not been invited to be present. Some of the gossip on the subject had reached Loring, who did not hesitate to say that he could not talk to a crowd, and that he did not care to show the curious things he had collected to people who would not thoroughly appreciate them. He had been very particular in regard to his invitations. At three o'clock on the appointed afternoon nearly all the people who had been invited to the Unicorn Theater were in their seats. No one had stayed away except for some very good reason, for it was well known that if Herbert Loring offered to show anything it was worth seeing. About forty people were present, who sat talking to one another, or admiring the decoration of the theater. As Loring stood upon the stage where he was entirely alone, his exhibition requiring no assistance he gazed through a loophole in the curtain upon a very interesting array of faces. There were the faces of many men and women of society, of students, of workers in various fields of thought, and even of idlers in all fields of thought, but there was not one which indicated a frivolous or listless disposition. The owners of those faces had come to see something, and they wished to see it. For a quarter of an hour after the time announced for the opening of the exhibition Loring peered through the hole in the curtain, and then, although all the people he had expected had not arrived, he felt it would not do for him to wait any longer. The audience was composed of well-bred and courteous men and women, but despite their polite self-restraint Loring could see that some of them were getting tired of waiting. So, very reluctantly, and feeling that further delay was impossible, he raised the curtain and came forward on the stage. Briefly he announced that the exhibition would open with some fireworks he had brought from Korea. It was plain to see that the statement that fireworks were about to be set off on a theater stage by an amateur had rather startled some of the audience, and Loring hastened to explain that these were not real fireworks, but that they were contrivances made of colored glass, which were illuminated by the powerful lens of a lantern which was placed out of sight and while the apparent pyrotechnic display would resemble fireworks of strange and grotesque designs, it would be absolutely without danger. He brought out some little bunches of bits of colored glass, hung them at some distance apart on a wire which was stretched across the stage just high enough for him to reach it, and then lighted his lantern, which he placed in one of the wings, lowered all the lights in the theater, and began his exhibition. As Loring turned his lantern on one of the clusters of glass lenses, strips, and points, and unseen himself, caused them to move by means of long cords attached, the effects were beautiful and marvelous. Little wheels of colored fire rapidly revolved, miniature rockets appeared to rise a few feet and to explode in the air, and while all the ordinary forms of fireworks were produced on a diminutive scale, there were some effects that were entirely novel to the audience. As the light was turned successively upon one and another of the clusters of glass, sometimes it would flash along the whole line so rapidly that all the various combinations of color and motion seemed to be combined in one, and then for a time each particular set of fireworks would blaze, sparkle, and coruscate by itself, scattering particles of colored light as if they had been real sparks of fire. This curious and beautiful exhibition of miniature pyrotechnics was extremely interesting to the audience, who gazed upward with rapt and eager attention at the line of wheels, stars, and revolving spheres. So far as interest gave evidence of satisfaction, there was never a better satisfied audience. At first there had been some hushed murmurs of pleasure, but very soon the attention of every one seemed so completely engrossed by the dazzling display that they simply gazed in silence. For twenty minutes or longer the glittering show went on, and not a sign of weariness or inattention was made by any one of the assembled company. Then gradually the colors of the little fireworks faded, the stars and wheels revolved more slowly, the lights in the body of the theater were gradually raised, 
and the stage curtain went softly down. Anxiously, and a little pale, Herbert Loring peered through the loophole in the curtain. It was not easy to judge of the effects of his exhibition, and he did not know whether or not it had been a success. There was no applause, but on the other hand, there was no signs that anyone resented the exhibition as a childish display of colored lights. It was impossible to look upon that audience without believing that they had been thoroughly interested in what they had seen, and that they expected to see more. For two or three minutes Loring gazed through his loophole, and then, still with some doubt in his heart, but with a little more color in his checks, he prepared for the second part of his performance. At this moment there entered the theater, at the very back of the house, a young lady. She was handsome and well-dressed, and as she opened the door Loring had employed no ushers or other assistants in this little social performance she paused for a moment and looked into the theater and then noiselessly stepped to a chair in the back row and sat down. This was Edith Starr, who, a month before, had been betrothed to Herbert Loring. Edith and her mother had been invited to this performance, and front seats had been reserved for them, for each guest had received a numbered card. But Mrs. Starr had a headache, and could not go out that afternoon, and for a time her daughter had thought that she, too, must give up the pleasure Loring had promised her, and stay with her mother. But when the elder lady dropped into a quiet sleep, Edith thought that, late as it was, she would go by herself, and see what she could of the performance. She was quite certain that if her presence were known to Loring he would stop whatever he was doing until she had been provided with a seat which he thought suitable for her, for he had made a point of her being properly seated when he gave the invitations. Therefore, being equally desirous of not disturbing the performance, and of not being herself conspicuous, she sat behind two rather large men, where she could see the stage perfectly well, but where she herself would not be likely to be seen. In a few moments the curtain rose, and Loring came forward, carrying a small, light table, which he placed near the front of the stage, and for a moment stood quietly by it. Edith noticed upon his face the expression of uncertainty and anxiety which had not yet left it. Standing by the side of the table, and speaking very slowly, but so clearly that his words could be heard distinctly in all parts of the room, he began some introductory remarks regarding the second part of his performance, The Magic Egg. The extraordinary, and I may say marvelous, thing which I am about to show you, he said, is known among East Indian magicians as the Magic Egg. The exhibition is a very uncommon one, and has seldom been seen by Americans or Europeans and it was by a piece of rare good fortune that I became possessed of the appliances necessary for this exhibition. They are indeed very few and simple, but never before, to the best of my knowledge and belief, have they been seen outside of India. I will now get the little box which contains the articles necessary for this magical performance, and I will say that if I had time to tell you of the strange and amazing adventure which resulted in my possession of this box, I am sure you would be as much interested in that as I expect you to be in the contents of the box. But in order that none of you may think this is an ordinary trick, executed by means of concealed traps or doors, I wish you to take particular notice of this table, which is, as you see, a plain, unpainted pine table, with nothing but a flat top and four straight legs at the corners. You can see under and around it, and it gives no opportunity to conceal anything. Then, standing for a few moments as if he had something else to say, he turned and stepped toward one of the wings. Edith was troubled as she looked at her lover during these remarks. Her interest was great, greater, indeed, than that of the people about her, but it was not a pleasant interest. As Loring stopped speaking and looked about him, there was a momentary flush on his face. She knew this was caused by excitement, and she was pale from the same cause. Very soon Loring came forward and stood by the table. Here is the box, he said, of which I spoke, and as I hold it up I think you all can see it. It is not large, being certainly not more than twelve inches in length and too deep, but it contains some very wonderful things. The outside of this box is covered with delicate engraving and carving which you cannot see, and these marks and lines have, I think, some magical meaning, but I do not know what it is. I will now open the box and show you what is inside. The first thing I take out is this little stick, not thicker than a lead pencil, but somewhat longer, as you see. This is a magical wand, and is covered with inscriptions of the same character as those on the outside of the box. 
The next thing is this little red bag, well filled, as you see, which I shall put on the table, for I shall not yet need it. Now I take out a piece of cloth which is folded into a very small compass, but as I unfold it you will perceive that it is more than a foot square, and is covered with embroidery. All those strange lines and figures in gold and red, which you can plainly see on the cloth as I hold it up, are also characters in the same magic language as those on the box and wand. I will now spread the cloth on the table, and then take out the only remaining thing in the box, and this is nothing in the world but an egg a simple, ordinary hen's egg, as you all see as I hold it up. It may be a trifle larger than an ordinary egg, but then, after all, it is nothing but a common egg that is, in appearance. In reality it is a good deal more. Now I will begin the performance. And as he stood by the back of the table, over which he had been slightly bending, and threw his eyes over the audience, his voice was stronger, and his face had lost all its pallor. He was evidently warming up with his subject. I now take up this wand, he said, which, while I hold it, gives me power to produce the phenomena which you are about to behold. You may not all believe that there is any magic whatever about this little performance, and that it is all a bit of machinery. But whatever you may think about it, you shall see what you shall see. Now with this wand I gently touch this egg which is lying on the square of cloth. I do not believe you can see what has happened to this egg, but I will tell you. There is a little line, like a hair, entirely around it. Now that line has become a crack. Now you can see it, I know. It grows wider and wider. Look. The shell of the egg is separating in the middle. The whole egg slightly moves. Do you notice that? Now you can see something yellow showing itself between the two parts of the shell. See. It is moving a good deal, and the two halves of the shell are separating more and more. And now out tumbles this queer little object. Do you see what it is? It is a poor, weak, little chick, not able to stand, but alive, alive. You can all perceive that it is alive. Now you can see that it is standing on its feet, feebly enough, but still standing. Behold, it takes a few steps. You cannot doubt that it is alive, and came out of that egg. It is beginning to walk about over the cloth. Do you notice that it is picking the embroidery? Now, little chick, I will give you something to eat. This little red bag contains grain a magical grain, with which I shall feed the chicken. You must excuse my awkwardness in opening the bag, as I still hold the wand, but this little stick I must not drop. See, little chick, there are some grains. They look like rice, but, in fact, I have no idea what they are. But he knows, he knows. Look at him. See how he picks it up. There. He has swallowed one, two, three. That will do, little chick, for a first meal. The grain seems to have strengthened him already, for see how lively he is, and how his yellow down stands out on him, so puffy and warm. You are looking for some more grain, are you? Well, you cannot have it just yet, and keep away from those pieces of eggshell, which, by the way, I will put back into the box. Now, sir, try to avoid the edge of the table, and to quiet you, I will give you a little tap on the back with my wand. Now, then, please observe closely. The down which just now covered him has almost gone. He is really a good deal bigger, and ever so much uglier. See the little pin feathers sticking out over him. Some spots here and there are almost bare, but he is ever so much more active. Ha! Listen to that. He is so strong that you can hear his beak as he pecks at the table. He is actually growing bigger and bigger before our very eyes. See that funny little tail, how it begins to stick up, and quills are showing at the end of his wings. Another tap, and a few more grains. Careful, sir. Don't tear the cloth. See how rapidly he grows. He is fairly covered with feathers, red and black, with a tip of yellow in front. You could hardly get that fellow into an ostrich egg. Now, then, what do you think of him? He is big enough for a broiler though I don't think anyone would want to take him for that purpose. Some more grain, and another tap from my wand. See, he does not mind the little stick, for he has been used to it from his very birth. Now then, he is what you would call a good half-grown chick. Rather more than half-grown, I should say. Do you notice his tail? There is no mistaking him for a pullet. 
The long feathers are beginning to curl over already. He must have a little more grain. Look out, sir, or you will be off the table. Come back here. This table is too small for him, but if he were on the floor you could not see him so well. Another tap. Now see that comb on the top of his head. You scarcely noticed it before, and now it is bright red. And see his spurs beginning to show on good thick legs, too. There is a fine young fellow for you. Look how he jerks his head from side to side, like the young prince of a poultry yard, as he well deserves to be. The attentive interest which had at first characterized the audience now changed to excited admiration and amazement. Some leaned forward with mouths wide open. Others stood up so that they could see better. Ejaculations of astonishment and wonder were heard on every side, and a more thoroughly fascinated and absorbed audience was never seen. Now, my friends, Loring continued, I will give this handsome fowl another tap. Behold the result a noble, full-grown cock. Behold his spurs. They are nearly an inch long. See, there is a comb for you. And what a magnificent tail of green and black, contrasting so finely with the deep red of the rest of his body. Well, sir, you are truly too big for this table. As I cannot give you more room, I will set you up higher. Move over a little, and I will set this chair on the table. There. Upon the seat. That's right, but don't stop. There is the back, which is higher yet. Up with you. Ha! There, he nearly upset the chair, but I will hold it. See. He has turned around. Now then, look at him. See his wings as he flaps them. He could fly with such wings. Look at him. See that swelling breast. Ha ha. Listen. Did you ever hear a crow like that? It fairly rings through the house. Yes, I knew it. There is another. At this point the people in the house were in a state of wild excitement. Nearly all of them were on their feet, and they were in such a condition of frantic enthusiasm that Loring was afraid some of them might make a run for the stage. Come, sir cried Loring, now almost shouting. That will do. You have shown us the strength of your lungs. Jump down on the seat of the chair, now on the table. There, I will take away the chair, and you can stand for a moment on the table and let our friends look at you, but only for a moment. Take that tap on your back. Now do you see any difference? Perhaps you may not, but I do. Yes, I believe you all do. He is not the big fellow he was a minute ago. He is really smaller only a fine cockerel. A nice tail that, but with none of the noble sweep that it had a minute ago. No, don't try to get off the table. You can't escape my wand. Another tap. Behold a half-grown chicken, good to eat, but with not a crow in him. Hungry, are you? But you need not pick at the table that way. You get no more grain, but only this little tap. Ha ha! What are you coming to? There is a chicken barely feathered enough for us to tell what color he is going to be. Another tap will take still more of the conceit out of him. Look at him. There are his pin feathers and his bare spots. Don't try to get away. I can easily tap you again. Now then. Here is a lovely little chick, fluffy with yellow down. He is active enough, but I shall quiet him. One tap, and now what do you see? A poor, feeble chicken scarcely able to stand, with his down all packed close to him as if he had been out in the rain. Ah, little chick, I will take the two halves of the egg shell from which you came, and put them on each side of you. Come, now get in. I close them up. You are lost to view. There is nothing to be seen but a crack around the shell. Now it has gone. There, my friends, as I hold it on high, behold the magic egg exactly as it was when I first took it out of the box, into which I will place it again, with the cloth and the wand and the little red bag, and shut it up with a snap. I will let you take one more look at this box before I put it away behind the scenes. Are you satisfied with what I have shown you? Do you think it is really as wonderful as you supposed it would be? At these words the whole audience burst into riotous applause, during which Loring disappeared, but he was back in a moment. Thank you, he cried, bowing low and waving his arms before him in the manner of an eastern magician making a salam. From side to side he turned, bowing and thanking, and then, with a hearty, Goodbye to you, goodbye to you all, 
He stepped back and let down the curtain. For some moments the audience remained in their seats as if they were expecting something more, and then they rose quietly and began to disperse. Most of them were acquainted with one another, and there was a good deal of greeting and talking as they went out of the theater. When Loring was sure the last person had departed, he turned down the lights, locked the door, and gave the key to the steward of the club. He walked to his home a happy man. His exhibition had been a perfect success, with not a break or a flaw in it from beginning to end. I feel, thought the young man, as he strode along, as if I could fly to the top of that steeple and flap and crow until all the world heard me. That evening, as was his daily custom, Herbert Loring called upon Miss Starr. He found the young lady in the library. I came in here, she said, because I have a good deal to talk to you about, and I do not want interruptions. With this arrangement the young man expressed his entire satisfaction, and immediately began to inquire the cause of her absence from his exhibition in the afternoon. But I was there, said Edith. You did not see me, but I was there. Mother had a headache, and I went by myself. You were there, exclaimed Loring, almost starting from his chair. I don't understand. You were not in your seat. No, answered Edith. I was on the very back row of seats. You could not see me, and I did not wish you to see me. Edith, exclaimed Loring, rising to his feet and leaning over the library table, which was between them. When did you come? How much of the performance did you see? I was late, she said. I did not arrive until after the fireworks, or whatever they were. For a moment Loring was silent, as if he did not understand the situation. Fireworks, he said. How did you know there had been fireworks? I heard the people talking of them as they left the theater, she answered. And what did they say? He inquired quickly. They seemed to like them very well, she replied. But I do not think they were quite satisfied. From what I heard some persons say, I inferred that they thought it was not very much of a show to which you had invited them. Again Loring stood in thought, looking down at the table. But before he could speak again, Edith sprang to her feet. Herbert Loring, she cried. What does all this mean? I was there during the whole of the exhibition of what you called the magic egg. I saw all those people wild with excitement at the wonderful sight of the chicken that came out of the egg and grew to full size and then dwindled down again and went back into the egg. And Herbert, there was no egg and there was no little box and there was no wand and no embroidered cloth and there was no red bag nor any little chick and there was no full-grown fowl and there was no chair that you put on the table. There was nothing, absolutely nothing, but you and that table. Even the table was not what you said it was. It was not an unpainted pine table with four straight legs. It was a table of dark polished wood, and it stood on a single post with feet. There was nothing there that you said was there. Everything was a sham and a delusion. Every word you spoke was untrue. And yet everybody in that theater, excepting you and me, saw all the things that you said were on the stage. I know they saw them all, for I was with the people, and heard them, and saw them, and at times I fairly felt the thrill of enthusiasm which possessed them as they glared at the miracles and wonders you said were happening. Loring smiled. Sit down, my dear Edith, he said. You are excited, and there is not the slightest cause for it. I will explain the whole affair to you. It is simple enough. You know that study is the great object of my life. I study all sorts of things, and just now I am greatly interested in hypnotism. The subject has become fascinating to me. I have made a great many successful trials of my power, and the affair of this afternoon was nothing but a trial of my powers on a more extensive scale than anything I have yet attempted. I wanted to see if it were possible for me to hypnotize a considerable number of people without anyone suspecting what I intended to do. The result was a success. I hypnotized all those people by means of the first part of my performance, which consisted of some combinations of colored glass with lights thrown upon them. They revolved and looked like fireworks and were strung on a wire high up on the stage. I kept up the glittering and dazzling show which was well worth seeing. I can assure you until the people had been straining their eyes upward for almost half an hour. And this sort of thing I will tell you if you do not know it is one of the methods of producing hypnotic sleep. There was no one present who was not an impressionable subject, 
for I was very careful in sending out my invitations, and when I became almost certain that my audience was thoroughly hypnotized, I stopped the show and began the real exhibition, which was not really for their benefit, but for mine. Of course, I was dreadfully anxious for fear I had not succeeded entirely, and that there might be at least some one person who had not succumbed to the hypnotic influences. And so I tested the matter by bringing out that table and telling them it was something it was not. If I had had any reason for supposing that some of the audience saw the table as it really was, I had an explanation ready, and I could have retired from my position without any one supposing that I had intended making hypnotic experiments. The rest of the exhibition would have been some things that any one could see, and as soon as possible I would have released from their spell those who were hypnotized. But when I became positively assured that every one saw a light pine table with four straight legs, I confidently went on with the performances of the magic egg. Edith Starr was still standing by the library table. She had not heeded Loring's advice to sit down, and she was trembling with emotion. Herbert Loring, she said, you invited my mother and me to that exhibition. You gave us tickets for front seats, where we would be certain to be hypnotized if your experiment succeeded, and you would have made us see that false show, which faded from those people's minds as soon as they recovered from the spell. For as they went away they were talking only of the fireworks, and not one of them mentioned a magic egg, or a chicken, or anything of the kind. Answer me this. Did you not intend that I should come and be put under that spell? Loring smiled. Yes, he said. Of course I did. But then your case would have been different from that of the other spectators. I should have explained the whole thing to you, and I am sure we would have had a great deal of pleasure, and profit too in discussing your experiences. The subject is extremely. Explain to me, she cried. You would not have dared to do it. I do not know how brave you may be, but I know you would not have had the courage to come here and tell me that you had taken away my reason and my judgment, as you took them away from all those people, and that you had made me a mere tool of your glaring and panting with excitement at the wonderful things you told me to see where nothing existed. I have nothing to say about the others. They can speak for themselves if they ever come to know what you did to them. I speak for myself. I stood up with the rest of the people. I gazed with all my power, and over and over again I asked myself if it could be possible that anything was the matter with my eyes or my brain, and if I could be the only person there who could not see the marvelous spectacle that you were describing. But now I know that nothing was real. Not even the little pine table, not even the man, not even me, exclaimed Loring. Surely I was real enough, on that stage, yes, she said. But you there proved you were not the Herbert Loring to whom I promised myself. He was an unreal being. If he had existed he would not have been a man who would have brought me to that public place, all ignorant of his intentions, to cloud my perceptions, to subject my intellect to his own, and make me believe a lie. If a man should treat me in that way once he would treat me so at other times, and in other ways if he had the chance. You have treated me in the past as today you treated those people who glared at the magic egg. In the days gone by you made me see an unreal man, but you will never do it again. Goodbye, Edith, cried Loring. You don't. But she had disappeared through a side door, and he never spoke to her again, walking home through the dimly lighted streets. Loring involuntarily spoke aloud, and this, he said, is what came out of the magic egg. 